Good morning and welcome to this uh, live and virtual gathering of Agora Church on uh, this Lord's Day, Sunday, May 5th, the Cinco de Mayo of 2024. Let's uh, pray together. Lord, uh, our lives aren't really like Cinco de Mayo. It's not that we have one great battle at one time that we define ourselves by and rejoice over, but we, with you, we have victories every day. And so we are thankful to you for the rich blessing that you pour out on our life. Help us to keep perspective of all the good in the shadow of the lesser number of challenges and sometimes even tragedies that we face. So bless us today. Help us to have this perspective we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We are uh, continuing our study of the Ten Commandments, and Nikki has our scripture reading for the day. Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land your, the Lord your God is giving you. And Ephesians 5, 28. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Good morning, church. Thanks for being with us today. If you would, please join us as we sing this morning. down and take my place with all of the saints and sinners who've looked upon your face and as you come breathe new life in me the fountain that you have built will spring eternally
the focus of our uh, congregational prayer time today, I'd like to be on uh, our uh, college campuses, especially, you know, this is graduation season, so the graduation events this very morning, uh, just um, less than a mile away, the uh, tens of thousands of family, friends, and students will be gathering for the Ohio State University graduation. Yesterday in Ashland, Ohio, we had uh, the graduation for Ashland University, which is the sponsored university of the Brethren Church, and it had the largest uh, audience attendance and one of the largest graduating classes of all time. I will comment, because it fits in with our message today, that it went uh, without interruption, it went with great dignity and respect, and without protest. And one of the reasons I would say is that, particularly at Ashland University, the focus is on teaching students how to think, not what to think. And they have opportunities all through the year to, uh, in their classes, especially in our government history in the Ashbrook Center, the uh, political science type of dimensions. Uh, there, the curriculum uh, has no textbooks. If you're, whatever you're studying, you study original materials, whether it's the Constitution of the United States, correspondence of suffragettes who were fighting for the vote for women. You work from those original documents, even up through contemporary documents, and then respectfully in the class, these things are discussed and they are debated. And people learn that their opinions can be heard. They learn that they will be treated with dignity and respect. And they don't feel so powerless that they keep escalating even to the point of illegal acts to be seen, to be heard, to have their viewpoint reflected. I think there's a lesson there for us to consider across our society. There's a lesson there uh, certainly to be considered on our university campuses. Uh, I think it's sad that many of these students who didn't have a high school graduation in 2020 because of the pandemic now have had uh, university students have had their commencements canceled or they've had their commencements uh, interrupted. Uh, that the flavor of celebration uh, distracted. Uh, and so I think that's that. And so we're gonna pray for that aspect of our country, uh, of the universities here and colleges here in the United States. I will uh, add, ask you to continue praying for our, uh, the family of our brother, Victor Martin. Uh, because his life was split between Ohio and Florida, there's not going to be here in Ohio a traditional memorial service as we understand it, but it's still important for us uh, as a church plant family these past few years to be supporting uh, his family, both in Florida and here, friends and in, in coworkers in Florida and here supporting them in prayer, and we'll be doing that. And as always, we'll allow time for you to bring your own requests before the Lord. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, our message today is going to be on the fifth commandment. And we're going to consider respect for parents, but actually it lets us consider the whole issue of respect. We begin this prayer expressing our respect for you and the fact that you also give uh, dignity and respect for us as your creatures and call us to respect one another. We wanna pray for uh, especially the commencement of OSU just hours away. We want to pray for uh, safety. We pray that it would be the celebration that students deserve. We pray for her, those students and many who are not students who feel so desperate to make a point that they might lose sight of uh, the nature of the event and, and what this was all about, the forger journey of these students. And so we do hear their voices and we commit to respect all the peoples of the world and especially suffering people of the world 
But for this day, we pray uh, help for those who have to maintain decorum at those events, who have to maintain security at those events, and that whatever happens uh, at OSU or other places, that it would be what the students deserve. It would be a time of uh, joy and celebration and reflection and thanksgiving for accomplishment. Lord, we pray for family and friends of uh, our brother, Victor Martin. We give him totally to you for uh, your embracing him in love and welcoming him to his eternal reward. For those who continue our journey on earth, we ask for your comfort and we ask that we would, uh, with dignity, respect his name and his legacy. Lord, we uh, turn our thoughts now to other matters, and as is our custom here at Agora Church, we're going to pause for these moments of silence so that since we've been in this posture of prayer, you, Holy Spirit, can bring matters to our heart that we would be sharing with you when the spiritual family of Agora Church is collected and gathered together. So from this time of silence, let your people lift other prayers to you at this time. Lord, thank you so much for hearing the prayers of your people. We give you glory for all the times you've heard us and answered us in the past and heard us and still are weaving into your plan the purpose of that prayer. We pray that you would bless your people today with joy and peace, a sense of thanksgiving that they have brought their words of thanks, their words of praise, and their petitions and intercession to you and can with great confidence, faith, and peace in their hearts, leave them with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I uh, think I've mentioned many times that I was raised uh, in an unchurched home, but I had this special blessing that in their later years, both my mom and my dad came to faith in Christ and were uh, exemplary Christians. And that is, they, they certainly were examples to me. And they were committed and they were passionate. Uh, uh, my mom especially, my mom lived longer than my dad, uh, went on to uh, be on a team that planted a church when she was in her 80s. She... Uh, started many ministries to senior citizens. They are everything a Christian son or daughter would hope for. And I realize what that does is that brings a certain healing to me that other people don't have who have parents that maybe didn't share their faith. That can be a disappointment. Parents who were maybe neglectful in their duties, that's hurtful and painful. Maybe parents who were abusive, which is hurtful in even another way. Uh, you have this whole range of parental experience. And I realize for some people, at the, if I hadn't seen my mom and dad come to faith in Christ, I only had those early years of uh, neglect and abuse I would have a different perspective, and I might even be a different person because the struggles I face would be different. I'd have to pursue healing down other channels, and uh, the Lord's always there to help us heal, right? We're not stuck by the circumstances of things that help it to us, but they can define the challenges we have. And so when we come to this commandment, then you have people like me that say, yay God, mom and dad, are the kind of people I would have loved to have had in my church, hundreds of them, and what amazing things we could have done. Thank you, God, and please uh, bless them and take care of them till I'm there with you and can see them again. Uh, that, that's very different from having to hear the Lord say, 
honor your father and mother when you know they were dishonorable. Honor your father and mother. Give them respect when you know they were despicable. So this is a, co a commandment that when we step into it, we should have a sensitivity to the range of experiences of our audience. And yet, whatever our experiences, or whatever your experience is right now, it does not change that this is God's command. Honor your father and mother. I will often see uh, adult children struggling with their parents and uh, choices and consequences of their life. And when, from that difficult position, they're honoring their father and mother, I consistently and intentionally try to call out and tell them, wow, God's happy with you. God's pleased. I know it's hard. You're being a good son. I know it's hard. You're being a good daughter. But God knows if we don't listen to this truth behind this commandment, if we don't, as I've kind of wove into our congregational prayer, learn how to give respect to one another, even when we are unrespectable, even when we are despicable, if we don't learn how to give respect to one another as human beings, the human race's condition and experience and journey is going to be far darker than it needs to be. One of the things I've done in your message notes, so we're talking about respecting others. One of the things I'm going to talk about is three types of respect that exist in the Bible that we're taught to offer people. If you want to think of it maybe as three bases for respect that we're supposed to have. And uh, the first of these is uh, kind of like, wow, that's asking a lot. And I, I call it respect based on human dignity, but it comes down to really you respect people because they're a human being. It's kind of the minimal basis, right? They're a human being, and because of that, they deserve respect. Uh, we were blessed with early in the year, uh, Pastor Josh did this good series, this great series on uh, the book of James, and we kind of turn there now, where in James chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, he talks about the fact that human beings are created in the image of God. Now, that's about one of the earliest messages we get in the Bible, back in Genesis chapter 1, that um, in the beginning, God created uh, the human race. Male and female, he created them. They are, and we are, created in the image of God, God's image. There is something special about human capacity, human morality, human responsibility, human uh, psyche, emotions, uh, these, uh, this ability to have compassion, to be creative, uh, to interact with the universe in uh, a form of higher intelligence, all of these things are reflections of who God is. And he said, we're made in his image. And then he comes and said, because of that, every human being deserves respect. Every, and uh, I like James chapter 3 because in James chapter 3, it takes it down and says, so be careful how you talk about another human being. Right? It's one thing to say, every human being deserves respect. When they need medical care, we're going to go give them medical care. When um, they're incarcerated, we're going to seek restoration and re rehabilitation, not just punishment and torture. Uh, this goes further and says how we speak about other people, whether their actions have been respectful or despicable because they're a human being. Uh, I attended a, uh, because they're a human being, they deserve dignity and respect. I attended a discipleship conference with a couple of pastors this week, one of whom uh, was in Desert Storm, and he talked about the challenge of Desert Storm of taking all those hundreds of thousands of Iraqi prisoners. And the personal challenge he found as the commander of a tank unit 
uh, making sure that his uh, team, those soldiers that, uh, uh, over whom he had command, that they treated the prisoners with dignity and respect. One of the ways human beings find to violate this principle of God and to do horrible things to one another is that we have a step before this. There's kind of maybe three steps. First, there's disrespect. Then there's a step of dehumanizing. You can particularly watch this happen in warfare where soldiers are sent out, they're told to fight the enemy, and almost reflexively, they begin to create these titles for the enemy that move them to a different category. They become krauts, they become gooks, they become ragheads, they become Yankees. They become the little Satan. You create these titles almost reflectively, psychologically, because in warfare, you do some of the most terrible things that human beings do to one another in taking one another's lives in savage and violent ways, and we reflexively dehumanize them. That's not a good thing, and all ethical militaries try to lift the mindset so that you don't go there, that you uh, pay attention and treat uh, even the enemy soldiers with dignity and respect. You always keep that as a principle because everybody knows that's the foundation of civilization. It's the foundation of morality. But this can go to other realms. In your own mind, in social and political discourse, when we begin changing how we speak about people and we begin dehumanizing. Sometimes it doesn't change the title. They just become the dirty, rotten whatevers. They, they uh, become uh, the dirty, rotten X. They're no longer my neighbors. They're my filthy, rotten neighbor. And you know we get work worse than that. We have horrible epithets for people because of their religion, because of their race, because of... Uh, their orientation or choices they make. And so we dehumanize them. We've taken a step from disrespect to dehumanizing. And the next step is to treat them in inhumane ways. It's a necessary process of how the evil of the human heart works. And God tries to stop that at the beginning and says, don't go there. Doesn't matter that you have no reason to respect that person for what they've done, for what they say they're going to do, for the values of their own individual choice or their culture, they are still a human being created in the image of God and you respect them. So that's the first one is respect based upon human dignity. There's a second one the Bible talks about and that is respect based upon position. We um, get really have to put this commandment in that uh, category, right? Because a person has a certain position. And we can see it for, uh, in the Bible, we can see it for spiritual leaders. We can see it for uh, the age that people have. We can see it for role in government. We can see it uh, uh, in uh, situations like this for role in family. So there are these various roles. I always think of uh, that uh, experience uh, in one of the last episodes of Band of Brothers where Major Winters is in the Jeep and Captain Sobel goes by and you have to see the whole series to know what are the tensions that develop early on. And Major Winters calls out to him because he walks by without, support, without uh, saluting and he reminds Captain Sobel, we salute the rank, not the person, right? Our system is based, what, on respect for our superiors, and so that's part of that military uh, culture. I, I think there was a quote from, uh, I think it was from Harry Truman to Douglas MacArthur that said, I, don't, I really don't care what you think about Harry Truman, because there was an intentional slight between the two of them, uh, 
and uh, MacArthur had slighted his commander in chief, or at least that was the opinion of Harry Truman, and Harry Truman says, but I do care that you respect the President of the United States, your commander in chief. And so there is respect that is given because of a person's role. So both of these first two, because they're a human being, because of their role, they're not conditional, right? It says you respect human beings and then you get lots of ways out of that so you don't have to treat them as human beings. Or the second one, um, you respect the leaders of your government, but only if they're doing what you want or only if you deem them to be respectable. You respect mother and father, but only if they are people of moral character and excellent parental performance. These are not the case. These first two, respect because they're a human being and respect because of their position, those are unconditional. There is another kind of uh, respect, and that is respect upon character and deeds. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, Paul is talking to Timothy about making sure that those who engage in full-time Christian work receive uh, the financial support they need to be able to carry out their work. And then he says, and especially if they do a great job, right? Recognize them. Increase the honor and honorarium if they execute things with judgment. And so there is uh, respect that's based upon a person's character, respect upon a person's deeds. We should never withhold that. We may not have liked them in high school. We may not enjoy their presence and their temperament, but a person who acts with morality, a person who acts with integrity, a person who executes their work with excellence, all of those things in God's system, in God's economy, deserve respect. Again, I said at the, early, at the beginning of the service, I'm so grateful that my parents, after a struggle in the early part of my life, found Christ and then became exemplary followers of Christ so that I've got all three of those for mom and dad. Not everyone does but there's still sufficient basis to say there's no way out of fulfilling the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, and the principles behind it. Now, the Bible speaks of the vital importance of respect in at least three facets of family life, and we'll go over these uh, quickly now. And the first thing I want to say, the Bible's very clear. If you desire God's blessing on your life, Demonstrate biblical respect for your parents. Uh, we read, Nikki read for us, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul's talking about this commandment. And he said, honor your father and mother. Why? Because it's the first commandment with the promise. It is, as it's uh, laid out in the book of Deuteronomy, it says that your days may be long in the land to which your Lord is sending you. There is a blessing that goes uh, specifically with respect for parents, but I would say that respect is, respect for others is always blessed by God. God blesses us. God is delighted in us when we show respect for people because they're created in the image of God, they're a fellow human being. God is delighted when we show respect for people because of the position they hold, and he's told us that's a position that deserves respect. As well, uh, God uh, blesses us when we respect those who do an exemplary job and certainly deserve and have earned respect in even a non-theistic, a non-biblical, a non-religious sort of dimension. They deserve that. And so if you desire God's blessing on your life, find the spiritual journey and healing that allows you to honor your father and mother. I know at times you can't honor them for the job they did as parents. I know at times you can't honor them uh, for the excellence of their character. But you can always honor them 
First, because they're a human being. And second, because they had a role, a divinely appointed role in your life, however they did with it. And you say, this is my father and mother. I honor them before God. Now, uh, I also had Nikki read from a little earlier in Ephesians. And this is a second area. We're going to expand this principle because in the Ten Commandments it speaks explicitly, directly of parents. But all through the Bible you'll see it's basically woven throughout uh, the family. And so parents receive respect, but they also are to give respect to one another. Husbands and wives are called upon by the Bible to treat one another with mutual respect. Respect one another is one of the one another commands of Scripture. The world and the family doesn't necessarily fall apart if you don't honor your father and your mother. Just from talking about pragmatics here. You certainly miss a blessing of God. You're in disobedience to a command of God. But if in a marriage there is not mutual respect in front of the children, you sow the seeds of multi-generational dysfunction. Multi-generational dysfunction. So the Bible calls husbands and wives to uh, show mutual respect, to speak respectfully, to serve one another respectfully, to offer at the minimum dignity, but to, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, there should be honor and celebration. All of those should exist out of respect that exists there in that very vital role of a family. A third thing, and again, we had uh, Ephesians chapter 6 read because it goes and says, tells uh, children to honor their parents, but it wraps up by saying, and parents, don't think that God only cares about respect in one dimension of the family that children have to respect their parents. The Bible's very clear that parents should offer dignity and respect for their children. Always, I mean, we can go down the list. They're human beings. They should be treated as, with dignity and respect as human beings. More than that, they have a role in your family, and it's one God says should be honored, and you should seek not to constantly uh, frustrate and exasperate them. You should be a good listener, and you should adapt your parentering style to what's going on in a child's life, whatever age they may be. Respect and certainly that respect when they're doing well, there should be that honor and celebration coming from a parent's mouth. Uh, it was more true in uh, the baby boomer generation where performance and achievement was very uh, important. Fortunately, there have been changes in our culture. It's not as, as prevalent as it was because it was once prevalent. It's not as prevalent, but you can still find parents of all generations uh, who are unreasonably, in an insane way, reluctant to praise their children because then they won't work as hard. What you're really saying is you're taking something that is a human being, and certainly as a child, they fundamentally need to be affirmed, to be seen, to be recognized, to be praised. You're taking that away from them, a fundamental human need, to get them to perform better. And what you'd get is a twisted performance. You, you get this child desperate to please a parent that will never be pleased, and you meet these men and women, maybe you're one of them, that are then twisted and affected for the remainder of their life. For the remainder of their life. Don't do that. Offer respect. Here's what I'm saying, or trying to say. Look closely at any commandment through the lens of the rest of Scripture, 
and you will find some value close to God heart, God's heart. The prohibition of theft that we're going to talk about in our later commandments here is about God's value of generosity, taking that which is your own and giving it to be someone else's. Theft is just the opposite of generosity, taking that which is someone else's and making it to be yourself. The prohibition against adultery is about fidelity, devotion, focus, on a spouse which creates a unique form of bond and trust. In the fifth commandment, what we see is not just honor that flows to parents, but we see the value God places on respect for his creatures, respect for fellow human beings, respect for people who take roles in society and the family, uh, respect for those who accomplish and do things that help society and that please God. We obey this command in more ways than just honoring our father and mother, but really at the end, honoring and respecting one another. Let's pray. A lot of guys say, Lord, I, I experience from you respect. You, you respect me. And if anyone knows the degree to which I'm imperfect and certainly to your standard of perfection disrespectful, but you value me as your creature. And you give me opportunities and you give me choices and you give me forgiveness and blessing. You respect me. That's stunning. How pathetic, then, of me if I should disrespect anyone else. How pathetic of me to withhold that given so abundantly from you from your fellow creatures. I do pray in a special way, Lord, for whom, those for whom this commandment is especially difficult whose mom and dad were totally absent, whose mom and dad were abusive, whose mom and dad were neglectful, whose mom and dad were disrespectable in many ways. I pray for them, that you'd bring them insight by the help of your Holy Spirit, you'd bring them healing. You'd let them be able to live this commandment in your way, in a different way. And from this commandment, be able to have a profound, respectful impact on the lives of people around them. I thank you for my mom and dad and what you did in their later years. Thank you so much for that, Jesus. I pray I'd be a son that could be worthy of their example as Christians. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and thank you for joining us today on our journey through the Ten Commandments.